Hi there, welcome to Cloud Native Skunkworks. Today we're going to be talking about Kubernetes and Kubernetes. It's all about virtualization today. I thought this would be an interesting episode because we're really going to go down a layer from what most folks normally have to think about. And this is an interesting use case because I see more and more conversations around how do we start to create multiple clusters in a secure way. Well, there is a way to run clusters in clusters, which means you don't effectively have to spread out a big splash of load balances and network traffic rules across um, a, you know, a uh, hyperscaler. Instead, what you could do is run it within a single supercluster and keep that self-contained and almost like a multi-tenant in a box situation. If you're a DevOps engineer or an SRE, you could provide your team with a cluster each inside of the same supercluster. So this is going to be uh, an exemplar for how you do that using L0 and L1 hypervisors in GCE. Now, before we get more into that, I want to just sort of pinpoint that there are some projects out there that try to solve this, but we're not looking at a facade here. We are actually looking at how we run multiple clusters through virtualization, and that brings with it all the benefits of network and storage isolation that many of these other projects just cannot accomplish. It also means that quality of service is extremely bounded because you're running a virtual machine inside of Kate. Now, there are going to be a bunch of tools and components I'm going to talk about, but mostly it's going to be through KVM virtualization, KubeVirt, and then we're going to look at K3s for our tenant clusters. So without any further ado, let's just have a quick overview of what virtualization is available on GCP. Now, you can see that here on my page, I've got nested virtualization, uh, the overview. And just like I mentioned a moment ago, we talked about L0 and L1. What we're doing is we're effectively connecting our L1 host hypervisor. I'm going to call it our host because that's where we're running our kubelet, our host hypervisor into the GCP substrate of the physical node. Now, this is using their hardened KVM hypervisor that is enabling this. And what's really exciting is this also means that we can do hardware-based virtualization, which brings with it immense performance improvements over software-based virtualization. It also mentions further down the docs that you want to be using uh, an architecture that is Haswell or above. Now, just to give some context, the Haswell architecture is the um, the spiritual successor of the Ivy Bridge architecture. And with that brings a large set of improvements in the overall performance and capabilities. And so we're going to be needing to use some slight customizations on GCE so that we can set up a special type of VM that suits us to run not only KubeADM, Docker, KubeVirt, KVM, but everything else that we need uh, to successfully host a multi-tenant platform. And I'll put more of that in the second video, but we're also going to be looking a lot around the networking side of things as well and creating NICs within KubeVirt and exposing those back out to our VPC. So without further ado, I've created a guide on Cloud Native Skunkworks multi-tenant in a box. And the idea here is that you can follow this set of instructions and it will take you through everything you need uh, to get through to where I am today. So I'm going to follow my own guide but I'm going to give some narrative around this and what we're doing and why we're doing it. So first things first, you can see here that I'm creating an Ubuntu machine, but I'm customizing the uh, CPU architecture to be Haswell based or above. We also need to think about having potentially four CPUs, ideally eight, and memory allocation of at least 12 gigs of RAM. We're going to be running tenant clusters inside here. So this is going to be the bounding box for whatever we can run inside. So I've created that right now. So let's go through the rest of the guide and figure out what we're going to do. So the first thing is that I've created an installer script. This installer uh, will go through and enable us to actually be able to set up things like uh, IP table rules. It will go off and grab the binaries that are required for kubectl, kubeadmin, etc. So let's copy this over. So first things first, uh, I'm going to grab my shell script, you can see it says we've got an error. That usually is just because the machine's booting up and you're trying to do an SCP before the machine started. Um, I can also see in the docs here, I've got a back tick and I'll get rid of those two back ticks later on. It's a work in progress. Okay, so what we do is we copy the, in the install script over and now we're gonna run that install script. So this installer is something, as I said, it gives you all the prereqs for running kubeadm. It also sets up KVM locally on your host machine. There are a few options that are important, uh, one of which is to enable Kimu KVM uh, with AppArmor, and I'll show you how to do that. It's, it's here in the, in the hack section because there are a few nuances that might trip folks up if you've not done this before. So as you can see there, the Kimu KVM service uh, is being linked, 
And that is super important because later on, we're going to run some validation steps from kubevert. And from here, we can keep going. So again, I'm just going to keep going with that install. I need to go back and update that uh, shell script slightly because I've only um, written it this morning and there are a few little tweaks that will help you out. But overall, it's installing the things we need. And we'll go through the validation steps in just a moment. So at this point in time, we have our L1 hypervisor on our host instance being created and provisioned. The idea is that it's also going to start up kubeadm. And from kubeadm, we're going to run a single master node that expands across the entire uh, resource profile of this node. And we can run our tenant clusters inside of it. I like to think that at this point in time, while we're provisioning, it's a good chance to think about some more of the use cases for this particular project. Now, I mentioned if you're a DevOps engineer or an SRE trying to give your team a couple of clusters, that's sure as one. But another is that you can start to perform chaos testing and high volume load testing in a constrained environment where you don't have different network subnets. You can even introduce um, network interrupts as well. Things like disk interrupts are also easy to emulate if you control the underlying storage classes. And we'll talk a lot more around the day two exercises of this later on in the second video. So we've got everything installed. I did see one error around adding my user to kubevert, but I'm not super worried about that in this point in time. So you can see here I've got the next step as actually running the kubeadm installer. Now, if you've not worked with kubeadm before, kubeadm is a fantastic project just because it is a very quick way to get up and running with Kubernetes. I recommend to check it out, and that's just in the Kubernetes IO docs um, as a, an officially endorsed uh, methodology for starting Kubernetes. So I've used the same thing. And what we can do in the next videos is we can extend kubeadm with its configuration profiles so that we can actually set a, uh, a subnet for our cluster beyond the uh, default that I put here. And we can start to play around with how we want to segment our tenant clusters. At this point in time, we'll see as well that kubeadm is doing a bunch of stuff. And it's important to remember the relationship with kubeadm and the kubelet, and that they both are effectively domains that live on the host node. So let me just open that up. So you can see that the kubelet is running off of this node. I think that sometimes folks get a little bit confused with what is Docker and what is the kubelet. Well, the kubelet is running as a systemd process. So we go system control status kubelet. We can see that our kubelet is running and it's orchestrating our containers with Docker. So we go get pods or namespaces. We should probably do something else before we do this. And that is to copy the, the kube config locally. So let me just go ahead and follow my own guide. So here we make the kube folder in our home directory. We copy over the config from the admin path. Now if I try and do a kube control get pods, we've got nothing in the default namespace. Great, so we've got basic Kubernetes running. The next few steps are fairly specific to what we want to do. So we're installing Flannel as our CNI, and we're installing Local Path by Rancher as our CSI. And these are purely for convenience at this point in time. We'll come back here and consider those options later on, especially when we consider using a difference uh, between the host CNI and the tenant cluster CNI. So there we go. We've now got um, those additional configurations set up. So if I go back to get pods, we should see our local path provisioner is up and running and our flannel pod is up and running. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to install kubevert. So kubevert already had the vert CTL installed as part of the installation process. But now I'm installing the operator, the CRDs. And here at this point in time, I'm going to enable the feature gate for hot plug volumes. This is important, and I'm not going to go into hot plug volumes in a great level of detail, but this is what allows us to attach PVCs. And this is really interesting and especially useful because if we're running a tenant K3S cluster in Ubuntu, I don't want to have to have a massive root disk on this pod that has all my tenant cluster data in, inside of it. I want to be able to provision PVCs on the host. For example, if we think about our hypervisor here. That's effectively our, our, um, our node. And we have Docker and Kubernetes extending over this way a little bit. A PVC, what, it, what actually is that? Well, the PVC is going to be a host path that gets mounted, right? So 
it's far more effective to use hot plugging to plug in that PVC, which allows me to scale it up or scale it down, than to statically allocate uh, a chunk of the host path, especially if I want to start to use another provider for PVCs. I might even want to pull in some external um, SAN or NFS uh, on the host and use that as a guest PVC. So there's a lot more to be said about that, and we'll cover that a bit later on. But for all intents and purposes right now, we've got our hot plug volumes feature enabled. So let's go back to our guide. Now, at this point in time where we apply the feature gate, we want to run this little hack that I, I had to find. So this is just because there are some variances between the Debian and the Ubuntu install, but we're going to symlink uh, Kimu KVM. And then once we've done that, we are going to jump into uh, the App Armor folder. And from the App Armor folder, and this is something I found in a really good kubevert issue where somebody else has done a lot of the work. If we go to here, in fact, we go kubevert, um, and I believe it was Kimu KVM. Somebody has quite helpfully put their own experiences and inside of the etc app armor d for libvert let's go and have a look at that and let's go to zen and so just below here is where we're going to add in our configuration for kimu kvm and we're going to do a system control restart uh, app armor and this is crucial because without this being restarted uh, we will see uh, an issue in the ability to run kubevert. So let's have a quick look. I might have spot something wrong. Yeah, it looks like I made an error in that file. So let me just go back. Oh, it's missing a, uh, a comma. Let's restart that. Status. Okay, we're all good. So at this point in time, we're we're set up on our hypervisor, but there's one next thing we can do, and that is using the host validate command. This host validate shows me one more thing, and that is, oh, KVM is not world writable. And that's typically because your current user, which is Alex Jones in this case, hasn't been added to the libvert group. And actually you can see that um, in my next step, I do talk a little bit more about the app armor, but I need to put a link in there. But as for this issue right here, you can see I've already done this before and I managed to get this to pass. So let's just have a quick look at, um, if we go group add libvert. Okay, that exists. Um, okay, oops, and it's new group. And I'll just pseudo that. I think the group is already around, that's cool. So what I want to do is, yeah, and we've done a sudo add user to KVM. Great, there we go. And as it's described here, we can just do a new group KVM. Let's try that again. And we're looking good now. So KVM is accessible. So with all that said, we should be pretty good to go. So now let's check our guest cluster. We might have to restart um, the vert handler. No, that's running. Cool. So this gets us to a place where effectively we have the virtualization layer running. We have the Kubernetes and Docker layer running. And I wanted to finish this video by taking us to this final stage of getting our guest operating system up and running. So let's take a look at how to get this guest operating system up and running by first of all looking at what the custom resource uh, for kubevert defines. And you'll see earlier on I defined this vert launcher. The vert launcher is part of a chain of resources, but the first point of this chain is the virtual machine. The virtual machine provides the template for the resources that are going to come together to create two more resources. The virtual machine instance, which is the running representation of the virtual machine, and perhaps the more familiar pod resource, which is the container uh, wrapper. So these are the things that will get created. This virtual machine here, you can see, has the bare minimum in terms of options. We have an Ubuntu-based container disk, 
And the reason that this isn't just running vanilla Ubuntu is that there are some changes to the way the image has been uh, compressed, but also the resources and services running on that image. You could also provide anything you want, really. You could provide a container disk with your own operating system or any other spin that you see necessary. But the second, perhaps more important thing for us is that we now have the cloud init disk um, that attaches a cloud init config file that gets run when the guest VM starts. So think of it like this. Your virtual machine is a dot image file. Now that gets loaded in to the runtime and that then becomes the composite of the virtual machine instance with the running operating system in the image and the cloud init file. And those then effectively give you a running state pod and that running state pod you can interact with. So that's a lot of me speaking there, but hopefully it'll make more sense once I show you inside of our multi-tenant GC node, we have this script right here. Now I've not copied in the run command from cloud init because I think it'd be a nice thing to do to show some dramatic flair at the end. So let's go ahead and get our pods and see whether or not this is running. You can see now that the launcher has been created. Now let's connect to that through the vertctl console. Now what we do is we provide the name of the VMI, which is going to be tenant zero. Um, helps when you spell it correctly. But what you can see happening here is this is launching the Ubuntu instance. So this is the guest OS now that is being launched. What's exciting is that you can customize these OSs as well. You can provide them with multiple NICs attached into them, multiple um, PVCs. And we can even provide them with a bunch of out-of-the-box services pre-installed to lower the installation time. So you could pre-install Kates, K3s, um, or Docker to make this experience quicker. You'll see also that Ubuntu, Ubuntu is the username and password that I set in the cloud init file. And to learn more about cloud init, I suggest you uh, check out some of the docs, but it's a powerful way to um, create files, to configure these operating systems, and to get going. And the last thing I'll do, as mentioned, is just to give us a little highlight of where we're going to go with next episode. This is installing K3s, and this is cool because this effectively means that we are now ready to go. Just to give some context to what we've been talking about, Virtualization is extremely important because it allows us to segment at the network, at the storage and at the compute level inside a cluster in very real terms. It's not a facade. We actually have real isolation on those resources. Quality of service guaranteed, quote unquote. It also means that we have now an exciting opportunity to create clusters, guest clusters, inside of a single Kubernetes cluster. And if you think about that from the logistics point of view, from a financial and an auditing point of view, it's all in one box, in one place. If you want, you could scale up the amount of host uh, GCE clusters, uh, nodes, and to have more reliability, more availability. But fundamentally, running Kubernetes in Kubernetes is now an enabler because we could deploy this out on a single node, a big node to a bunch of people in a team, or we could scale it out and start creating a service fabric a platform within a platform so that the CNI and the underlying CSI, we define, right? We're not relying on EKS. We're not relying on uh, GKE. We're actually effectively creating a tenant-based architecture within our organization. And that might sound a little far-fetched for a lot of folks who are just end users of Kate's and the workload API. But when you need to start taking that a bit further, for example, in the next video, we're going to look at container network interfaces and how to run multiple interfaces. Or even if you are looking at how to do complex storage solutions, being able to facilitate your own Kubernetes tenant clusters is a very important paradigm. So thank you very much for listening. I know that this might have been a lot to take in. There are a lot of concepts that I only brushed over, but I'm happy if you want to comment, if you want to chat to me um, to go through these, please do read the code. Uh, it's all up there on the Cloud Skunkworks multi-tenant in a box repository. Next episode, we're going to be looking at how do we do CNIs, CSIs? How do we actually customize the K3's config? We need to provide it a valid IP. We need to start thinking about how do we do the day two operations and to actually get connectivity from the real world. So thank you so much. 
please do like and subscribe and I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.